I'm John Buchanan, and in this video we're going to explore the power of Logic's arpeggiator. Now when we think about arpeggiation, we think about the sort of classic sorts of rolling sequences that we hear in electronic dance music records all the time. What I've done here is to set up um, an analog pluck sound from um, RetroSynth. I've turned on the arpeggiator, and we tend to think about arpeggiators doing things like this. Okay, and the reason that we think about that is because it's a great sound, it's exciting, it's fast, it's rapid, it's doing all kinds of things, and of course what we're effectively doing is taking a chord of notes that we're just playing, breaking it down and have the arpeggiator do the rest. Now exactly what is going on? If you're new to arpeggiation then let's just have a quick look at the parameters that exist within this particular sequence that I'm playing right now before we begin to move on and see what else we can do with arpeggiators. So at the moment you can see that what I've got is an arpeggiator that's moving upwards in terms of movement. If I hold down a chord, it will play the lowest note first and then cycle up through anything else I'm holding down. And I can also see the rate of change here is currently set for 16th notes. Of course, arpeggiators allow us to do things that we simply can't play. If I take the rate up to 1 over 32, I get this. And so suddenly we get a totally different kind of sound, a very computery sound, and of course there's a huge power and momentum that comes from that. Let's take it down to 16th again for a moment. So I can vary the direction of travel, so if I want an arpeggiator that sort of comes out of the sky and starts high and drops low, then I can do that, or of course I can have an arpeggiator that goes in both directions. So there are a number of modes for me to explore. What I can also do is to introduce randomization, a variation, so effectively what's happening is that the arpeggio is now going to uh, introduce variation to the pattern, so that effectively it's just getting away from a completely fixed movement. And I can introduce um, octave range change as well, which means that rather than just playing a pattern over one octave, it will start to introduce notes from two or three or four octaves. Okay, so we've still got a sound that sounds very like a classic arpeggiator, but we're just starting to introduce some variation. Now, the only thing is that in the context of other styles of music, this sort of an approach where we've got this kind of super bright synth sound um, sort of feels like it wouldn't fit with loads of other different styles of music. And so people tend to overlook the potential for Logic's arpeggiator in the context of music that isn't quite EDM based. But actually we can create sequences with the arpeggiator as well, which is where life gets a whole lot more interesting. What I'm going to do is to reset the octave range and the variation. And what I'm also going to do is to come back to just upward movement for a moment. But what I'm also going to do is to take the rate down to eighth notes. So at the moment I've been working in what's called live mode, which means that effectively whenever I play any chord, the arpeggio would simply just the arpeggiator will simply just break down the notes within that and play them back at the rate and in the direction that I've specified. But if instead what I do is to come down to grid mode, what I can do instead is to start to build a pattern. Now, any individual step, what I'm um, doing when I vary this bar for step number one is I'm changing velocity. So the um, higher the velocity, usually the louder and brighter the sounder is going to be, and the more muted and um, less loud it's going to be um, is determined by how low this individual bar is. So what I can do is to go through and basically just create a series of steps where I'm varying velocity. Now, that's fine, it's still going to effectively now just play this back, giving me an opportunity just to sort of create the shape that I want, and that's absolutely fine. And now when I play notes, what we're going to get is we're going to see the grid playing. So the crucial difference here now is that I've introduced velocity variation. But what I can then do in order to kind of get something that's a bit more like a kind of sequenced pattern is that I've got the opportunity to switch on what's called chord mode. Now what I'm going to do is to turn that on for steps one and seven. And what that means is that when I play my sequence through, the first step and the seventh step will play all of the notes that I'm holding down. So at the moment the arpeggiator, we're used to thinking about it as sort of breaking down a chord and playing one note within it, but by switching on the chord mode option, what I have a chance to do is to effectively have the arpeggiator play all of the notes that I'm currently holding down.
Okay, so straight away, now what I've got is something which doesn't sound quite so much like a sort of regular arpeggiator, but actually sounds more like a kind of sequence part. Now, there are lots of ways to create sequences within Logic, but this is a really nice way of just being able to think, okay, well, I'm probably going to get something that I haven't actually had to sort of program myself, place a note in a grid or place a note within a step sequence. This is almost inevitably going to throw up some variation, and particularly if we engage variation and octave range change. Okay, but so far we're still working with the same synth sound and therefore it's still suggesting a particular type of music. What I'm gonna do is to close this arpeggiator down and just mute this first instrument and come down to another treatment that I've created for um, Sculpture. Now Sculpture is Logic's physical modeling instrument and we'll definitely explore Sculpture in another video. For now what I've done is to create a sound that is a little bit more organic, a little bit more like a kind of kalimba style instrument and again, I've put an arpeggiator on top of it. And again, I've created a sequence here, which has got the first note um, playing the whole chord that I'm gonna play. But what we're gonna get now, when we come into a sort of lower octave, is something that feels more like a kind of integrated sequence that's much less kind of pokey than the sound that we were playing before. So what I've got now is this much more muted kind of sound and we can hear the chord that's being triggered on the downbeat. Remember, it sounds like an odd thing to say, but if you're recording notes like this, make sure that you quantize them because what that's gonna do is to make sure that that first chord triggers right on the downbeat. And as a result of that, it won't be in the previous bar. There's just a risk that if I play a chord early, it's actually in bar one and when the sequence plays back round, actually I won't hear it because the notes belong in another bar. But what we've got with a sound like this is a much murkier, much more interestingly sort of sequence sound in the context of the track that I've got playing behind it. Here's the sequence and then I'll unmute it after four bars. we've got this much more sort of integrated sort of sound and the arpeggiator is sort of providing that for us. And again, it's playing a really similar pattern to the one that I programmed for the previous synthesizer, but it's got a very different tonal characteristic as a result. So then we've had a chance to look at a sort of second approach to working with sequenced arpeggiated sounds within a much kind of different context. Let's look at a third way that we might use the arpeggiator and that's to produce unusual beat patterns. I'm gonna just mute these four instruments that I've been working with and instead I'm gonna come down to this minimal glitch kit down here at the bottom. Now this is an ultra beat kit, um, literally called minimal glitch. And what I've done is to set up an arpeggiator here as well. Now this time what I'm doing is I'm using Logic's random shape, which is basically going to produce or choose from a random note depending on the notes that I'm uh, holding down. If I only hold one note down, there's no randomization it can choose. But if I choose uh, or hold down more than one note, Logic's gonna pick a note at random. You can see that I've created a grid here as well. So effectively I've got different velocities that are gonna play back and we've got a row of 16th notes. Now what you can also see is that the octave range is currently set for two. Let's just see what happens when I turn it down to one for a moment and hold down just one note. What I'm expecting, of course, is that there can be no randomization and we're only playing one octave, so I'm just gonna get kick drums. Sure enough, if I introduce a second octave, however, we're now going to get this C1 and also C2, and of course, Logic's gonna choose one of those notes at random. Okay, so what happens if I want to start building unusual 16th note beat patterns? Well, all I've got to do is basically introduce different notes, hold different notes down, release them, just try some things out.
Now, if I engage record mode and just record some of this stuff, if I suddenly create something that's interesting, that's just a little random collection of sounds that feels like it would be interesting, I could very easily turn that into audio, chop it up, and create little bits of beat loop, which is just going to potentially fit under any production that I'm working on and just provide me with something a little bit different. And the great advantage of working with arpeggiation this way is that I haven't got to think too carefully about being responsible for the sounds that are being produced. I've effectively created a system here which stands a chance of producing something interesting when I play different notes. So within this video, we've looked at a number of different ways of creating sequences with the arpeggiator. We've looked at the sort of classic arpeggiator sound on a sort of classic synth sound. But what we've then done is to apply that to a much murkier, um, sort of slightly roughed up production, the sound that we use there within sculpture. And then right at the end here, what we've done is to look at the potential for this kind of grid pattern approach to working with drums. Little moments that might just spring up randomly that suddenly allow you to make your programming become something totally unusual, unpredictable and unique.